Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for Learning Fuses 2023 Summer Demo Day. We really appreciate you joining us today. And our graduates are really excited to present their final projects to you, something that they're very proud of, a full stack application that they've built from scratch. So just to give you an idea of what you can anticipate from this event, we have four presenters. Each presenter will talk about their project, present it to you, um, and then we'll have about five minutes for Q&A for that particular presenter before we move on to the next. So we anticipate this lasting until maybe about 7 p.m., could end a little bit early, um, but I'll go ahead and have our first presenter jump on board. So be Sean, take it away. Thank you. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Can you guys see everything and hear me? Yes, you're okay. good to go. Okay, cool. So, hi, my name is Bishan, and thank you all for coming. Um, for my project, I'll be displaying um, my project called Retail Raider, and it is essentially a web application for um, shoppers who want to rate and review stores as well as see other reviews made by other people. So, when you first land onto the page, the first thing you'll see is a prompt to log in, or if you can't, if you don't have an account, then to create an account. So. First, we'll just register as a person named Tim. Now that, now that it's been created, we'll just ignore that. So when you log in, <clears throat> uh, first thing you see is a prompt to, to add a store and you have a form here. And then it also shows all of the stores that have already been inputted by previous people. Right now, all these buttons to the right are um, gray because it is not your input. So you're not authorized to edit it, but we'll add a store itself. So we'll do good, will OC, location is intestine. And the price range will say it's one because it's a goodwill. So here, now you see it at the bottom here, um, you can edit or delete it. And currently there's no stars and no reviews because we just made it. And there you can see you could delete it and then you can go on someone else's entry. So we'll go to this one and then add a review and we'll just say five out of five, I love it. And so now you can see a review here, which has all of your information. And then if you go back, you could see how the ratings changed a little bit and it shows the average rating as, as well as how many reviews there are. And that's the main feature I'll be talking about um, is being able to see the overall satisfaction and how we kind of put that together. So now like looking over at the code, um, sorry, this menu's like in my way a tiny bit and I'm trying to move it, sorry, okay. Um, so here in my, well, first of all, I'm using a Pern stack. So it's a full stack web application using Postgres, Express, React, and Node. Um, and so from the database side of things, I have three tables, one for users, which is the people who have logged in, created an account. And then um, we have the stores, which is all of the stores. And it has various information, such as the ID of that store, who it's created by. And then, of course, the name, location, and the general price range of that store. And then we have reviews which this part is important, which is that it has a store ID so that you can connect what store specifically that review is being put on. And then we, of course, have the ID and then other information on those reviews. So if we go to the server.js, we have some API routes here, but the most important one for the specific feature that I'll be talking about is the first one. And here you can see that I'm creating um, a SQL query where I'm essentially joining two tables, which is my reviews as well as my stores that where I have reviews for each specific store. And when I when I join these tables, I am I make a query where I am essentially counting how many reviews there are for that specific store. And then we're also averaging the reviews. So we're counting how many there are and then that divided by um, the rating. And so just to put that into kind of some perspective here, um, I have this query here in PG Web and it just shows an example of, of what that query would make. So as you can see, we have the store ID and then all that information on the store, but now we've joined some information from a separate table where we're um, creating the account and um, average rating columns so that we can, we can see how many ratings there are and the average rating. So, so that is what we create. That's essentially what we send back to the client. So when you go to your store list, um, First, we have a use effect, which 
um, has an empty dependency array because when the page is first rendered, we want it to only run when it first renders. And when it first renders, we'll send a fetch request to that specific API. And then as I showed you on the server.js, we return that table with all that information. And once we've gotten that information, we set stores, which is created through my context. And we're setting the stores to all of the, to the whole list of all the information of, of the stores. Um, and so once that's occurred, now that we have stores, we'll map through the stores and create a table with um, all of the information, such as the name, the location, the price range. And then we'll also have the two buttons for editing and deleting the store. But we essentially have the same thing here and here, but the only difference is first we check to see if the user that created that store is the same as the user that is logged in. And if they are, then the buttons will not be grayed out. But if they are not, then the buttons will be grayed out because they're not authorized to do so. And once you've clicked on the, um, once you've clicked on a store and you see the information of each review, such as the person's name, the rating they put in, and the overall, uh, over the description of their review, the way you're able to see that is you go to store details and you send a request to that information so that you will have all the information on the reviews. And essentially what it returns is, um, a list of reviews and, and it's an array of reviews and um, each item in the array is an object and each array or each item in that array has the properties of ID, name, rating, and reviews. So we're essentially destructuring that object and then displaying that information for each card. So each blue card that you're seeing, that's how that review is created. And that contributes to the overall rating. So when you see here render rating, which is the main thing I want to focus on, that is what I call to display the stars, which is the average rating of each store. So I call the render rating function and I pass in the specific store um, that we're on when you click on one of the rows and we use the star rating component and pass in the average rating. So when I go to the star rating component, essentially what we're doing here is we know that we're gonna pass in five stars no matter what. We just don't know if it's gonna be a full star, a half star or an empty star, depending on if, depending on what the rating is. So we're going to loop through from one to five because we know we're pushing in five stars. And then, for example, if the average rating is like something like 1.5, then we would push in one full star and then push in and push in um, a half star. But then from there, the next three stars are empty because the rating never got there or got to that level. So that's why we're only that's that's how we um, decide essentially what type of star we're pushing in. And so that returns the array of stars. And that's how. Um, that's how that overall average rating is rendered, which is displayed here. Um, so that's the main component that I wanted to, or main feature that I wanted to talk about. And like I said, this was created using the Pern stack. And for the future, um, my first stretch feature was actually to add authentication. So prior to, when I first created the project, I actually didn't have authentication. Um, and I thought that was kind of silly because if you don't have authentication, then you essentially can update and delete anyone's entries, which is kind of silly. So I added the ability to log in and log out so that, you know, if you're authorized to manipulate someone else's entries. And then the next thing that I want to add is a Google Maps so that based off of the location that was put in by the user, they can put it on a map and then other users can see maybe like the closest store or where on the, where that specific store is located. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about. So thank you for listening. Amazing job, Bishan. Thank you. And are there any questions for Bishan at this point? Yeah, I, I was just gonna ask, how are you hashing the passwords? How am I, what's that? Hashing the passwords. Yeah, so here, let me go to, I have a, auth form here and then let me open up the files because that was a separate feature so I just got to find all my information on that so essentially I have um an auth page right and then I call the auth form and depending on if I'm signing up or signing in I will call a um, I will call a handle submit function, 
And I will essentially, um, oh wait, this was, sorry, this is a different file. I'm trying to, I, I went over this a while ago and I'm trying to find exactly what I used for. Um, Maybe on the server side, you can see on the server side what's happening. Yeah. Take your time, Bishan. Sorry about that. That's okay. Sorry to put you on the spot. I'm just no, you're, Yeah, you're all good. So I have two routes here for signing up. Um, I have a post request for when I want to sign up versus when I want to sign in. So if someone wants to sign up, essentially, um, it gets put into the database and then I create a query to sign up. And then once you've signed in, um, here we have information on the hashed password. Um, so let me see how I'm hashing this exactly. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. I might have to re-review how I'm hashing this because it's been a while since I, I uh, added authentication. I didn't review that as much. Um, That's all right. I, I I wanted to see what hashing algorithm you're using. So it seems like you're using Argon. Um, yeah. that, that's okay. Thank you for showing that. Okay, thank you. Nicely done. Thank you. Any other questions or? Okay. I have a, I have a question for you, yeah. Sean. If you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice, what advice would you give? Um, the main piece of advice I would give. So as you know, the the boot camp was a very fast paced boot camp. We we learned a full stack in just about three and a half months. So the main advice I would give myself would just to um, kind of trust in the process and be okay with struggling at first because it's learning to code is a very complicated thing and code is unlike any other subject that you've learned. It's not really math or English or science or anything like that. It's completely its own thing. So I think understanding that the way your, your brain is used to learning through like traditional schooling is different than when you're learning to code. So kind of taking that into, into mind when you're trying to learn to code is very important thing so that it kind of eases the nerves and you're kind of just more open to learning. Um, so that's kind of the main thing I would tell myself is to just kind of relax and just take everything in and trust in the process because over time you definitely will get a lot better at coding. So that's the main advice I would give. All right. If there are no other questions for Bashan, we'll go ahead and move on to Brenda. Any other questions? I have a question. Uh, sure. What did you like most? The, the data, the back end or the front end? I think personally, I liked the front end more and because I kind of like, I like knowing what the user is going to see. So when someone who's using your product is going to kind of mess around with the application and like, I, it's, it's nice to be kind of responsible for creating what they're going to experience. Um, but I, I really did enjoy the whole full stack. Like I enjoyed being able to interact with both the back end and the front end, because at the end of the day, like even though some people are more inclined to work on just one side of the stack, I think being able to work with all of it and knowing how everything works together is really interesting. And I think it makes it, even though it's a complicated task, it makes it easier to learn in the long term because you understand how everything works well together. But if I had to choose one side, I would choose, I think the front end was more interesting to me. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, Bashan. Okay, the next presenter up on deck is Brenda. So Brenda, take it away. All right. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Brenda. Today, I'll be showing you my app gym puzzle. The idea for this app came about when my friends and I were having a hard time staying motivated to work out. So we would bet each other, I bet you would work out twice a week for half an hour. And if you don't, then you owe me $5. We were keeping track of our workouts on Google Sheets before, which is great, but I wanted to expand on that by creating an app to have additional features. And thus, Jim Bosa was born. 
Gymposal, as you can see, allows you to keep track of your workouts and challenge your friends. I have a component on here using Chart.js where you can track your weekly workouts as well as your total minutes per each day to see how your endurance is progressing. You can also create groups with your various groups of friends, each with unique sets of requirements that you agree on, such as how many times each member agrees to work out every week, what qualifies as a workout based on total amount of minutes, and if you're placing any bets, which I think adds a fun aspect to it. All right, let's move on over. So this is the dashboard when the user first logs in. I created my app using React and Material UI for my components. As you can see, here's the um, chart that we had earlier and a comprehensive table with all of the historical data for that user. Below, we're able to see the groups that the user is a part of and any penalties where they didn't um, fulfill their bet for that week. Moving over to the group homepage, it's very similar to the home dashboard, except we have their data of each member overlaid on the graph and in the table. You can also see that they had requirements over here um, twice a week, half an hour per workout, and the bet is $5. So you can see that Harry has only worked out once this week and he's been slacking off. If he doesn't get another workout in this week, then he will show up again on this penalties table, which is what I want to show off today. This penalties table is refreshed every Sunday. That's when we run the query to see who has not um, met their requirement for that week. I had also done unit testing for my components using React Testing Library and Jess. Moving over to my code, I have a node scheduler on here, which works like a cron job, except it runs on node rather than on, um, on your system. And I can define a schedule or a date and time where I want this to run. And as we mentioned before, it is on Sunday at midnight. Then I have this asynchronous function where I go and review my users. For this um, app, I had used the day.js package to keep track of my date and time. I saw that the moment.js uh, had a lot of problems with it because it was created before JavaScript and the day.js was more sustainable for the long run as well as provided a more lightweight package. So I begin with the assess users function that I had in my server. Here, I will query using PostgreSQL, and I will gather a list of all users that are currently using the app and active. Once I have the list of users, I will recursively run through each of them and go through additional set of functions, starting with initial exercises. In initial exercises, I query my database to see all the exercises where that user has met or exceeded the duration requirement. This will occur for any group that they are part of. So it will create duplicate rows where duration requirements are different. And if that user did not exercise that week, then it will have an empty row to keep track that there is zero minutes. Next, I will qualify the exercises by taking a look at their week and year. I wanna make sure that we're only looking at exercises that is a week behind our current week. Once I have that, I will also look at whether or not the user is currently active in the group and if they had just joined last week. If they are, then I wouldn't want to penalize them for that week because that wouldn't be fair to penalize them on their first week. I then compile everything into my tracker object, keeping track of all the groups and penalties that the user has occurred. After that, I will move on to the query penalties function where I check to see all the existing penalties in my database. I do this just to double check that I don't have any um, duplicate entries if for any reason my scheduler had accidentally run more than once. 
And lastly, I will move on to the create penalties where I insert all the new records into my database. All of the data will show up on my components in the um, home page and in the group home page. So for here, I have a use effect where I have a promise to load various sets of data, including the penalties that we reviewed today. After the promise has resolved, then my component that I got from Material UI will upload and reflect all the data. In the future, I would love to have a more dynamic chart where our users can toggle between date ranges. That way they're not just stuck looking at the current week and able to see their historical data. I think it would also be fun to have the penalties more interactive where users can pass on any penalties themselves based on their allotted passes for the year or their friends can close it for them if they receive payment. Um, thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Let me know if there are any questions. Excellent job, Brenda. Are there any questions for Brenda at this time? Did you go over how to input a workout? No, but I can. You would just go over here to log exercise. And let's say I wanted to do 90 minutes. And then I can type in here and submit. And it will show just like there. And now Ron is really getting ahead of Harry on his workouts. Thanks. Thanks for asking. I have a kind of a super nitpick question, but I noticed you have that sort of background job going on. Um, and then obviously the app itself is running. Um, do you happen to run them separately or do they run together with whatever NPM start or however it's being run? So I deployed my app using Azure and it is always running my node scheduler will be running on top of that. So it is not in addition to it. Okay. Thank you. In the future, I think it would be interesting to convert this to be serverless. That way I don't always have to have it running um, if I had, uh, you know, wanted to enhance it further. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for you, Brenda. If you had to go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice, what advice would you give yourself? Um, for the course, I think when I very first started, it was very daunting to me to look at everything. Um, but I feel like I overcame that a lot by doing planning and as far as like the various issues we would have in GitHub and breaking down my tasks into chunks and various issues that I could do. So that was really helpful in me and just maybe starting that ahead of time and only looking at the current task at hand. Great. Are there any other questions for Brenda before we move on to our next speaker? Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, Joseph, I think you're on deck here. Go ahead and take it away. Awesome. Okay, so just move this out of the way. So my name is Joseph, and since the dawn of time, humanity has always sought the greatest goods from stylish shoes to sleek cars. We've always wanted the finest products. And in this new modern age, we're able to get the nicest digital swag. And what this app aims to serve is the ability to look at the game Valorant by accessing the community-driven, publicly accessible, and frequently updated unofficial Valorant API to get the newest content from the agents, weapons, weapon skins, 
any of its pertinent data, so on and so forth. So and when they arrive on the page here, they can go between each of the tabs that they like to see any of the latest content. And just to show how updated it is, there was a patch literally just yesterday, and it's already in the system. So I'm able to pull that content from their API and automatically set it so it shows how readily accessible it is to the public. I even uh, purchased the Valo Checker domain. So when you search it, it actually shows up as the one of the first results. Looks like it's number three right there for now. And this project actually helps a lot in that you're able to look at all this content without going to these article websites where you have to go through all these ads, go through different YouTube videos and scrub through for specific timestamps just to see the nice skin that you want to look at or the new character breakdown. And you definitely don't need to download these massive patch updates to see what the video game has to offer. And you may not even find it yourself. So if you're able to just log in through this site, you can just immediately look at what you want or what already exists. This website actually originated from my junior project, which was the halfway mark for the web dev bootcamp. And it started using the uh, ES5 direct DOM manipulation and step-by-step -step Ajax methods. And I wanted to make sure I could modernize it, add more to it, make it reusable, modular. And I converted it to use TypeScript, hook base React, as well as using Tailwind so that I got that crisp responsivity to work not only on this PC display as shown here, but to make it so that it could work on mobile displays and tablets as well. And I actually do plan to globally launch this pretty soon. So I hope to post it onto a website, maybe like uh, Reddit or, or Twitter, so that hopefully it can actually grow to where it fills the niche where I don't think this kind of product exists yet in the market. So for the product or the feature I want to show off today is to go to the weapons page here. And right now there's 18 weapons and you can see that they're all shown here correctly with their names and their icons. I want to show the phantom. You can click here to sort through using the filter box, filter even further by typing in there. Everything is properly debounced to make sure you don't flood the server and, and send everything properly. Click here to look at this. This uses the same data table component. It just renders data for that pertains to the gun rather than an image. And you can click here to look at the skins regarding that gun. So right now I have 57 items, but I don't want to have the user scroll through and look at all these infinite things and have an infinite loading screen. So what I created was a pagination system to show up to 25 results per page. You can go through, it works responsively, scrolls up nice and smoothly as you go through. And you can even reload the page or bookmark it and this applies to any page on this website here. You can go to a specific item that you want to for easy reference because it refers to any of the items in this dynamically created URL. So let's say I want to show off one of my favorite skins, the Reaver Phantom. You can look through here to see exactly what it shows. It has four different skin variations, including the base model, and has different showcase clips to show what the gun would look like. So you can really tell is this the right skin for me to style on those noobs? So clicking here to check that out. Let's rewind that. See what that looks like. And that works for all of these video files here. And to go over the code, like I said earlier, everything is created in TypeScript and hook based React. So you get a lot of the basic imports that you probably expect from a project like this. React, use states, use effects. Everything is handled with routing and navigation through React Router. I use a React loading spinner from the library React Loading. I have all my components stored at the top, all of the relevant pages here down there. I do something what I think is pretty cool with the loading context. So I have a context file that refers to the state for is loading or isn't loading or to set whether or not it should or should not load. And I wrap that here on my entire app so that no matter which page I'm on, no matter which component I'm looking at, it'll always be at the exact same spot, depending on if on that context, it shows is loading is true. And there are some other things here with proper semantic tags for the nav bar, main, div. All my routes are here handled normally with their proper optional parameters. And right here, it's all nested within my custom scroll to top function so that whenever a user scrolls through, or navigates between routes, it actually dynamically changes it so that they go to window.scroll200 to make sure they're always at the top. No smooth animation, they just start there. So it feels seamless. 
I have here my footer and I have a conditionally rendered show button for scrolling to top. So right here, this button exists to scroll to the top, has a nice smooth animation to go to the top. But if you may have noticed, it disappeared. It actively listens to make sure it goes up. Now to go through the rest of the code here, this one page is uh, handling the weapon skins, has a lot of the same things you'd expect from this type with React, use parameters to listen to say on the website here, the Phantom or the Reaver Phantom to load all that content properly. And then I use that to, or I destructure that from the use param so I can reference it. And then I actually created a custom use hook. So I have all these different fetch functions. And these ones are just to fetch weapons, individual weapons, maybe get all the skins entirely. But what I wanted to do to make everything modular and reusable is have an entire hook that listens for any kind of fetch function that I fit into it, any type of optional parameter I want to set to it. And I have one type for one that should expect to return an array and one type that should expect to return an object. And that's how I'm able to get the object for my weapon name here. I properly set it to variables so it's easy to reference instead of weapon data.skins. And then I make sure to do things like use my helper functions to make all the string and data content user friendly. Because a normal user probably doesn't understand what camel case is. I'm sure developers really just don't want to look at camel case and their normal web browsing experience. So I convert that to a readable, normal, user friendly code. And since it's all in TypeScript, I define all the props that it's expecting and what kind of values or exact uh, values they should be returning. Here shows my DOM tree, which is everything that you'd expect, a custom back button, a header where I set the text dynamically, a subheader with the custom custom uh, value there for their text, and a data table, which I mentioned earlier is reused on multiple pages. So depending on what data or data type or a weapon, if, if uh, given, determines what it should display on that data table. And the cool thing here that I wanted to show off with how the search feature works for finding that specific phantom or finding that specific reaver skin is this custom use of, or a use hook for the search value. And what I do is I feed it the proper function that it needs to, it listens as it needs to, and that is handled here with its custom hook. Like I mentioned earlier, everything is handled with debouncing. I set it up with a custom value of 40 milliseconds because I want to make sure that the server isn't overloaded so I don't break anything, but keeping it at a value where the user still feels like it's a lagless, seamless experience. And when you get to the individual skin page you want, you import all the same things that you'd expect. I required more helper functions here to say, convert the camel case or remove the words level or remove colons, et cetera, et cetera. I use my fetch function and my fetch object hook to make sure I can load the proper content that I want. And then just like before, I reference the values that I need so I can get the variations, which again, were the different skin colors or the upgrades, which are the different videos. And these are my custom functions to make it just user-friendly enough for this page specifically. I didn't put it into a separate utilities file because it's only used on this page. And just like how you'd expect it here, I have another DOM tree set up to show everything nice and properly. Again, it has all the dynamically set text um, text content. It's all fit into nice semantic tags like sections. And this one here shows the variations, which again, were the skin types, maps over any amount that there are. And the same thing exactly for the upgrades, which just to remind were the, the video types. So that's, that's the feature that I wanted to present today. I'm hoping to add a couple more things, can talk about that uh, later and I'm hoping to have a nice global launch and that other people just like me or my friends can enjoy looking at this content without going through articles, videos, or just downloading it. Just going right to the point and get exactly right what I need. Thank you for listening and I'm open for any questions. Excellent job, Joseph. Are there any questions for Joseph at this time? Uh, Joseph, I saw that you're using uh, an API. Uh, mm -hmm. So is is that one? That's one that you you didn't write. It's it's your. Is it an open source one, or is it a just available from the community? What is that one? It's really cool, actually. So right here, I can show you on my footer. I reference and properly credit the <laughs> API 
Valorant API is here. It's not endorsed by Riot. It's an unofficial one. But like you said, it's a community-driven one. And because they're so driven, they update it, like I said here, to get the latest content, which was just from a, a few hours ago, really. And this one here, all updated. And then I referenced this basically nonstop to get the exact endpoints that I was interested in and get the exact values that I want. And some of those other features, maybe incorporating some of these things, like the new game mode that they just added as well. Got it. I also saw that you use TypeScript. Mm -hmm. uh, why did you why did you decide that TypeScript was a good fit for this this project? So this this project actually originated with JavaScript ES5. And I knew I wanted to modernize it. And I knew I wanted to make sure that it was using the normal uh, practices in the industry. So first I converted it into normal JavaScript in React code. And after sorting everything properly and adding the proper modular reusable functions, I slowly converted it to TypeScript because it's a very in-demand and very, very useful uh, framework there. So as I was making it, I saw, hey, this one gives me a specific error here, handle it. This one is doing this, it's not gonna run, fix this part. So it helped make things uh, very easy to troubleshoot because it told me the problem first. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It looks like Troy has his hand up. Go ahead, Troy. Um, yes, uh, thank you for the presentation, Joseph. And I just wanted to ask, uh, mm -hmm. when you mentioned that uh, you don't want to overwhelm the server, are you referring to the Valorant API or your server? So when I'm debouncing, I don't want to send too many uh, HTTP requests, whether it's me sending it out or expecting to receive something from their API. I know that other APIs actually limit the amount of, of tokens that you can have to access it. And I wanna make sure I don't, I don't stress my server and I don't encroach on their API at all either. Okay, so in, in your server, what is your server built on? And, and can you tell me just a little bit about it? And is it a Node.js server that's running on Azure or you know something like that? Oh, yes, of course. So this project actually is almost entirely front end. It is created with Create React App, and it's actually hosted on Netlify's free tier and forwarded over to my custom domain on Google. So everything is, is hosted there properly. I, don't, I didn't feel the need to incorporate any, any back end code because all of it is parsing through and getting the correct data that I want. OK, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing questions. Any other questions before I ask mine? <laughs> All right, Joseph, you know what's coming. If you could go back into time and give yourself one piece of advice about your project, what would it be? Take your time and plan things out. It's a lot easier to make modular and reusable code if you understand what you would probably want to reuse in other pieces first as opposed to coding one large thing and then trying to break things apart into different pieces and hoping it still works later. Great. All right, any last questions for Joseph before we move on to our final presenter? All right, I think it's safe to say that Colin, you are next. Uh, you are our last presenter, but certainly not least. So uh, feel free to take it away. Great, thank you, Andriana. So let me just do a uh, screen share here. All right, can everyone see my screen? You're good to go. Okay. Let me just move this onto the screen over there. Make sure I'm all set up here. Okay, great. Uh, first thing I'd like to say is that uh, I'm really excited to be able to do this. Um, so thank, thank you everyone for, for joining. And, uh, Again, my name is Colin, and uh, the app that I'm presenting on today is called Finicelli Cycling Apparel, and uh, that's a full-stack e-commerce application where cyclists can shop for premium cycling wear. 
and I built it with the Pern stack. So that's uh, Postgres, uh, Express, Node, and React. And the interface is optimized for uh, mobile. It was designed with Figma and developed with Bootstrap and plain CSS. And let me just pull up the site here. So I'll show you uh, the mobile version first since it's a bit more op optimized for that. Um, so this is the home page, and I have a fixed nav bar here, and we can get to two different product categories, men and women. And we can also do that down here just by clicking on these buttons or in this uh, entire element with the uh, image background. And so take a look at men's products. So it's quite a few um, products to choose from. This is my own uh, back end that I created uh, as opposed to a third party uh, API. And women's products. I've been having a bit of trouble today with my Azure uh, back end. So it's not exactly working is probably going to take a second here to run. But uh, since that's happening, I'm going to try that again. And it's not. So I have here my, my local host, which I'll just use for a moment until uh, that one starts to cooperate. But so here we go to uh, product details. We can pull up product details, take a look at the image and some um, information and details. We can add that to part. And there we go. That's going to be um, added to cart and take a woman's product here and add that to cart. We have a couple items in cart there. And so you just click here to remove those. We have a total here at the bottom, $355. Stuff is not cheap, I know. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, in case you're curious as to uh, the inspiration for the, the project, um, I'm a passionate cyclist and I, um, Sorry, I, I forgot to do a part of my intro. I'm really sorry about that, but I'm a passionate cyclist and I love getting out for leisurely rides and I'm also into competition. So I, I go out for training rides a lot and also for competition. It's a hobby of mine um, that became almost more of a hobby uh, during my time living in Taiwan where I was for a few years studying Chinese, also studying business and working. And anyway, I love cycling gear and um, that includes cycling apparel and like quality apparel. And so this app uh, basically solves that problem. So getting back to the site here. Um, so that's the extent, extent of the site. Um, I will show you my desktop just so you can see that. And it's fully responsive. Uh, let me click here. Fully responsive. And the computer is a bit slow at the moment, but it should be working and responding. Here we go. Okay, so that is the desktop site. So uh, let's take a look at the feature that I'd like to present today, which is um, when we take a look here at a, a product category, we have this basically this whole element here can be clicked on. This is all clickable. And uh, we click on that, and that pulls up the product details. Take a look at how my uh, live site is functioning now. Okay, everything looks like it's working now. So I'll go back to my live site. And so we pull that up and we have product details. And that is the function that I'd like to show you uh, today is simply the rendering of product details. So I'll pull up uh, the code here. And so when we're on the uh, men's product category, um, each of the, each product is wrapped, is first of all, it's, it's mapped and then um, it's destructured and into these following uh, variables. And then we're gonna access those down here and uh, fill out the JSX and um, using the uh, variables up here, wrap in a React router link. And then that will take us uh, directly to this 
when that's clicked, that'll take us to this URL. And once we get to that URL, we'll be in the product details uh, page. So we're looking at our product details page. This happens to be product uh, number one. So you uh, just using use params, and, um, and we're going to grab the product number, and that will be uh, stored. And I have a use effect code here, and then I am going to uh, first do asynchronously. I'm going to call this. Uh, call, actually, I'm calling the function down here using product ID, and I'm going to. Uh, run that and then asynchronously do a fetch and to the back end using product ID. And I have my function separated down here. So running this asynchronous as well, function calling to the back end, this path here. Uh, if there's an error, we'll throw an error and um, otherwise that will be returned in a JSON format. And Take a look here at the back end, server.js. So here's the get request, and it would be uh, this pack here. We're using params to uh, store it. I'm going to store that, and that product ID, we're going to convert it to a number, store it here in this uh, variable. And if the ID, if there's, if there's an ID that's not an actual existing one, then we'll throw an error. Here's my SQL query. And we're looking for that specific uh, product number. And so down here, I'm actually asynchronously running that query um, using those parameters, the number, and also uh, the uh, parameters here. And if uh, there is an error, if it cannot be found, we'll throw an error. And if not, that's returned in, again, that's JSON format. So once that's returned, we are um, ready to move on in our use effect function, which, by the way, only renders when the product number is uh, only renders when the product number changes. And so we're going to use uh, we're going to use uh, use state and set that um, object into the uh, products category here. And once we have that available, um, if there are any errors, we're going to throw an error. And then while it's loading, it will show loading. We now have our uh, what we need to render our JSX. We have our product in our use state variable up here that is destructured into these variables. And then we are going to uh, render that on page using URL. Um, I, I named this URL, but this is actually um, the image, which is actually a, a URL that I'm taking from a third party site um, at the moment. But we have name, color, description, and details, and also a add to cart button here at the bottom. So there we got, there we have it our uh, image, name, color. Uh, information details and add to cart button. And so that sums up uh, the feature and concludes my presentation. Thank you all for listening. Um, any questions? Thank you so much, Colin. We really appreciate the wonderful presentation. Looks like Robert has a, Rob, I'm sorry, has a question. Yeah, first off, nicely done. Um, anything e-commerce, you know, as always, there's a lot of moving parts, but two questions I have for you. Um, first one, how are you handling add to cart? Where are you storing that information? And then second, I was going to ask, did you do anything about checkout process? Or, or um, I know, again, I know that's a very involved piece. So that's mm -hmm. not a trick question. I'm wondering if you even got a chance to, you know, take a stab at it. Yeah, the answer is uh, I have not even tried to take a stab at it yet, but it is on my to-do list. It is something I want to learn. Um, that was not something we learned in our curriculum, and we didn't do that for any of our exercises. 
Uh, I did see one other person in my cohort try to implement that while we were in the cohort, um, while we were in class, and he was able to do that. And he's, he's an excellent coder, and it was quite tough for him. Um, and he was only able to do it, I think, within that period of time because we had all the resources around us. So that means other classmates, but especially our instructor, Robert. Uh, so um, I decided that I was not going to do that right away, and I was going to work on some other things before I tried to implement that. But that is interesting, and it, and it is on my on my list. Uh, in terms of the adding to cart, I guess you're you noticed. I'm guessing you noticed how that was added. First of all, everything is done locally, stored locally. Um, but when I add to cart, so if I if I go here, I'm not sure if you noticed anything about how the page reset. Um, but Yes, so that is stored locally, and I am actually re manually refreshing the page when that gets when that gets sent to the, to the cart. That is a bug in my um, application that um, I just haven't put really high on the priority list, um, and but is is something I'm going to work on. And I wanted to use um, I wanted to use use state for that, but for some reason. Um, when I was in cohort, not too many, not too long ago, just a few weeks ago, uh, we were having a lot of trouble with that. And I was sitting with my instructor, I think two different times, and we spent uh, quite a bit of time trying to um, troubleshoot that. <laughs> and um, we we just couldn't. So um, I put it aside for now, and that's that's just how it's functioning at the moment. Thank you. All right. Any other questions about Go ahead. the application or anything else? <laughs> Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, so I want to know how many products do you currently have in this? Is, are these actually, I should ask, are, are all these products in the database that you were showing? They are all in the database. So that was a little bit um, of a process entering all those. But yes, they all are, they're all in the, in the database. I didn't need to put this many in, but you know, I like the way these these jerseys look. <laughs> I just think it's a really cool look aesthetically. I'm not a UX designer, but I really like how it looks. So I just put them in there. And um yeah, so it's about 40, I believe, for men and about the wow. same for, for women. And that's uh incidentally something I wanted to do uh, that I'd like to do later on. Is so add each some more add some more products or more product one? categories. Wow, Correct. that's that's no, I didn't sorry to interrupt you. It's just I was impressed. That's a lot of data entry. Was that um because I saw there was a paragraph for like a, each one of these par uh, uh products. Um is that all in the database too? Did you do you enter all that by hand? Uh these were all entered into the database, but I kind of tried to I kind of lined up all my ducks in a row, is that the phrase, and tried to um, simplify the process as much as possible, copy paste. Uh, the unique uh, parts of this is each photo obviously is unique, and then the title and the uh, color is unique for each of them. But the rest of this copy is um, some of which one? I can't remember which one. One of these is just a copy paste, so it's the same on every product. Okay. Um, and, and the prices are unique as well, so the prices um, are accurate in case you're interested in a jersey. <laughs> so those aren't made up prices? Uh, made up, but not by me. Not by so I, <laughs> <laughs> I took those and, uh, you know, eh, snooped on some websites and got some information I thought could be useful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, Colin. Sure, and thank you. All right. Any other questions for Colin before he might get a question from me? Or I could just answer it because I know what it is. Go for it. <laughs> so uh, what would I do differently if I, if I could go back? I think um, there's a lot of things I would do differently, but I think that's the process of learning is mm -hmm. uh, messing up and then learning from your mistakes. So I think the biggest thing is learning from the mistakes. But um, if I had to choose one, if I could choose one, I think uh, similar to what uh, B. Sean was saying uh, about, you know, this is my first time doing something like this and um, jumping into an accelerated program like this, and they're not going to stop for you. So um, 
in other contexts, I think you can really, uh, you know, you can take your stuff home and catch up and, um, you know, you can put it, put it aside for a while and work on it, but there's no slowing down with this 14 weeks. So uh, I wouldn't say panic, but I would start to worry a little bit uh, some, on, on some, um, some exercises and do some portions of the program. But I think what I would say to myself is looking back is, you know, um, it's okay if you if you don't get everything 100% and you'll have time after the cohort to learn it and you're not trying to become a senior dev right now, you're just trying to learn the basics. And as long as you have a, a, a basic understanding, um, if you, if you uh, there's some things you don't understand, it's okay, you'll get it later. Look where you've come so far, how far you've come so far. If you've done what you've done so far and learned 90% of it, that last 10%, if you don't have it, it's not gonna, not going to break it. Uh, it's not a make it or break it thing. You can get that later, obviously, because you got up to the, the, you got up to the ninety percent mark. But I think that's what I would, I would uh, change is just my handling of that because I I did let it bother me. Excellent, good piece of advice. All right, we are almost at the mark of seven p.m. Are there any final questions for Colin before we end our event? All right, well, it sounds like we are ready. Um, thank you very much for attending today. We truly appreciate you taking time out of your day to uh, see what we have to offer. Um, I went ahead and put um, all of our presenters LinkedIn URL in the chat. You also had it in the event invite. So if you feel like connecting with anyone, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, if you have Troy any- has a question. 